Irv Zilla gave me a ride down to New York City, uh, and uh, it was snowing. And uh, on the way, he started describing how uh, Fortran to me. And uh, as we were going down by Fornstark Park, we rounded a curve and uh, it was slippery there, and we skidded onto the wrong side of the road, narrowly missing some other cars, at which point Irving slowed down and went to his side of the road and quit talk talking about Fortran. And I've always blamed my ignorance of Fortran on that particular instant. Uh, anyway, I, I did learn enough to start programming away in the language. Uh, it was quite simple. This was Fortran 1. The most complicated thing was a, the format statement. Everything else you could sort of guess, and it worked the way you would have done it had you done it yourself, invented it yourself. So for that reason, I thought it was a very good language. Um, stretch was all done up in the 701 building? Uh, well, we had... Uh, uh, let me just see. No, well, I mean, in other words, uh, we moved our offices up in uh, the 703 building and we used the South Road Lab uh, in various things. The, the machine was assembled down in the South Road Lab. A lot of programmers got uh, offices down in the South Road Lab and we, uh, we, we had offices in the 703 building. How many people were? Were on the project. Um, I can't really remember, but uh, when it came to the programming, it got to a fair number. And we had, uh, 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 I didn't work on the compiler, but we didn't know much about it at the time. and. Uh, I, I, I would have, that would have been, I should have uh, done it and learned something about compilers earlier. Uh, in any event, Fran Allen worked uh, on the software and learned quite a bit. <coughs> so Fran was part of, um, Fran Allen was part of the stretch project? Uh, she got a job working on the stretch. At first she worked in, in the 701 sort of uh, the computing center there, I mean, uh, giving advice and getting the operating system going. That was sort of a little bit tedious. I mean, there was no memory protect on the, on the uh, 701. And I, I had written a simulator, a logic simulator, and the way that it worked is uh, to make a time step, it would uh, right shift uh, all the bits in the 36-bit word. I mean, it would do the logic. It would form in the high order bit uh, time T0 uh, logic, and then it would right shift to make it go to T1 and so forth. Well, in any event, uh, there was some slight bug in the program, and I looped around uh, the loop and uh, 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 went down through uh, the operating system right shifting all the instructions. <laughs> uh, those type of things happen when you didn't have memory protect. It, we were all planning memory protect on stretch and so forth. Uh, what would you call yourself in those days? Would you have said that you were a computer architect then? I don't know. I guess I was hired for, uh, for something like that. But I mean there was people who uh, were uh, legitimately computer architects like Fred Brooks and Jerry Blau who actually knew something, right? I was just uh, there learning and so forth, but uh, it, it was fun. Uh, after, did you ever teach? Uh, uh, well, I taught. Uh, I didn't teach it. I left Duke uh, and came straight to IBM, but I, I um, I uh, took off, uh, uh, and uh, at the time of just the beginning of 370, 360, I mean, and went to MIT and, and taught for a while, for like a semester, and, uh, or maybe it was a year. And then uh, 
I, uh, after HDS, I went to uh, uh, NYU and taught. So I don't know how successful that was. I used to have a bad habit of, uh, of erasing the blackboard right after what, uh, something I had written. And uh, Vicki Markstein uh, was asked by Jack Schwartz to take notes on my uh, lectures, and this caused it to be very troublesome. Yes, I did. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I have a lot of curiosity about gadgets. I like to find out how things worked and so on and so on and read stuff. And uh, I, I feel you learn a lot more uh, if I uh, hadn't been so lazy uh, I, and stuck with teaching or something. I, I would have learned a lot more about computers than I uh, now know. Yeah, that was... That was that would have been a good thing to have done. So you uh, finished at NYU. Let's talk about the ACS project. What got you into that in the first place? Well, uh, 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 Jack Bertram came from San Jose to uh, run the uh, computer science department in uh, Yorktown. And uh, I... Uh, uh, went to work for him, and Peoria told him he wanted uh, a large uh, machine project similar to Stretch and this and that, to what it had been. And so uh, Jack asked me to uh, help him put such a project together. And we, uh, 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 there was, uh, uh, At that time, uh, 360 had been done, and so uh, Peoria wanted some large scientific computers in which they didn't feel that 360, they felt that 360 was more commercial and, and so forth. In any event, uh, Jack and I sort of planned it. Actually, Amdahl uh, wrote a, a nice thing, the fastest a single instruction counter machine can run, and uh, it uh, it was, a, it was a very good article. I mean, I looked at, it had like three major hypotheses, all of which were wrong, in which case we were able to uh, notice that. And uh, for instance, he said, it, you can't de decode but one instruction at a time. And that would limit you to a maximum of one instruction per clock cycle, so to speak, whatever you design as a clock cycle. But we realized that that was wrong, and we decoded lots and lots of instructions on ACS and so on. And uh, we had, uh, uh, we were a little naive in those days about how to sell projects. And uh, we had uh, all kinds of ways that if, how we would spend our money and use, design it in certain ways so that its cost performance would be highly optimized, and uh, we had various charts about how this was going to be the case. We would give them to Peoria, and Peoria would say, no, Watson wants the fastest computer. Forget all this business about, uh, you know, trying to make it uh, cost performance and figure out how to make it the fastest scientific computer out, right? Well, anyway, uh, uh, we did try to do that. And uh, uh, also, we thought a little bit about cost performance. And uh, uh, Bertram was uh, very good about accounting. I mean, he learned about from the, our controller uh, a lots of things that cost money in building a computer. And uh, it turns out that the preliminary development isn't very much. I mean, if you start a project, uh, the corporation would go more and more negative uh, uh, as it uh, as it as you develop the machine. And but it turns out, just before announcement, you really start spending big money when you start making machines, lots of which aren't working, and fixing them. Um, you know, design mistakes. You make five machines that are bad, right? And you got to fix all of them, and so on and so on. So. Uh, and we had all kinds of 
horrifying thoughts about what higher levels of integration would do to us in this regard. I mean, making it not so easy to change blunders and so on. Right. What was I thinking about, about it? Uh, oh, that's how I met Bertram, and uh, uh, we started this project. And then uh, we, uh, Max Paley got involved in it and wanted to move it to San... Uh, uh, the thought was that uh, by being too close to Poughkeepsie and this and that, the, the project wouldn't be enough different from uh, what, we were, what the rest of the company was doing. So we moved out to uh, 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 Sand Hill Road. Uh, we moved to California and, and built a little building on Sand Hill Road, and that's where we, we eventually had the project. No, not at all. I mean, I was a bachelor, and, and uh, I rented uh, a, uh, another guy named Russ Roblin, who was also a bachelor, and uh, we rented a, uh, uh, a condominium that wasn't doing well. I mean, in other words, it wasn't selling, so we, we rented and so forth, and it was right on a golf course and all that. It was, it was good, and we could easily afford it and so forth. How long were you with ACS in California? Um, A couple of years, I guess, at least. Yeah. One of the that, that was a terrifically interesting project. We learned a lot. Ed Sussingas is going to give a terrific talk about it. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, when we would give presentations, for instance, we gave the SAC committee came out. And SAC was a lot more in those days than it is now. I mean, because when SAC came out, Tom Watson Jr. came out, right? And he listened to all the meetings. And uh, we had, uh, uh, Peori had people like uh, Alvarez and Wiesner and uh, Yang and uh, various uh, other prominent uh, physicists, right? And uh, Wiesner, I don't call a prominent physicist, but he was head of MIT, that, that is prominent anyway. And so, uh, and we had uh, uh, a guy who liked to do big calculations named Clements Rotons from the University of Chicago. He, he did uh, uh, these uh, quantum chemistry problems. So anyway, that, that was what SAC was. And, um, uh, Bertram insisted that our presentations be really worked on. I mean, he looked on it as an opportunity for, you know, you have these projects that are go on for years and years. Well, anyway, Bertram uh, was uh, various, made us work very hard on uh, making up charts and so forth, because if you have these long projects, they'll just dawdle. You won't get work out of people. It's hard to get people to work without deadlines, right? And Bertram would have us make up charts and be highly critical of them. So it was, uh, we had lots of deadlines and uh, he used uh, uh, SAC meetings and so forth as, as uh, deadline things. And so uh, Ed has like six hours worth of charts. Uh, from ACS. I never thought there'd be any reasonable record of it, but SAC things, since they all could possibly have uh, legal implications with what, stuff that was shown to Watson and so forth, all carefully kept. So Ed was able to get the charts for six hours worth of uh, lectures, and so uh, his presentation should be very good. And uh, I remember uh, one day we were going to have uh, Peoria and Fabini were going to get a special presentation and we had uh, like uh, the timing of the machine shown uh, systematically on slides and uh, so Sussengatz was going to give the talk and so we were going through the slides and uh, Ed says, now at this point we have 50 instructions in one form of execution or another. Uh, so let us consider what happens if an interrupt occurs. At which point Bertram said, nope, nope, nope. 
PR and Fabini are not going to see this presentation. So that did away with that. But uh, anyway, th we learned a lot uh, at that time, uh, making multiple instructions go uh, on a single, being decoded on a single cycle, doing instructions out of order we found was important, and things of that nature. Uh, and uh, uh, having schemes that made it uh, such that uh, you got the same answer as you would have gotten had you done it in the correct order, but for one reason or another an instruction is held up, delayed, and, and you uh, for lack of facilities or something, and you uh, stop that and then you have to go out of order uh, because you can let other stuff work and you'll be throwing stuff away if you don't, if you don't have out of order execution, which is sort of messy. But anyway, we learned that we had to do it and did figure out how to, how to make it come out uh, logically correct. Well, we learned a whole lot. Uh, cash, things that we had people like uh, Dick Arnold invented uh, the way of making two and four way set associative cash, I believe. I mean, I'm not really clear on all of that, but the schemes that the Model 85 had, which was the first cash machine, was, was extremely primitive. And Arnold had these two way set associative ideas, and four. And to my knowledge, Cash has been made that way ever since. And uh, I thought that was awfully good. And we, we had no statistics. We didn't have traces to prove that this was going to work. But Arnold developed uh, arguments as to why uh, two-way and four-way set associative would be uh, as good. He compared it with completely associative. And we had uh, various arguments as to why it was, was going to be good without even statistics, why cash would be valuable to have. So uh, we, uh, uh, we could use it now. We, we should have some better statistics. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I, I thought I learned a lot on ACS. Obviously, I learned a lot on stretch because I, I knew nothing when I started with stretch. And ACS, I knew something, but... Uh, 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 it was a very, very good project. When you came into ACS, did you already think of yourself as an expert? Or do you feel that ACS was really the grounds in which you developed? Well, I don't think of myself as so much of an expert actually, even now, you right? So I talked over you at the beginning, so why don't you start again? Uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think of myself as so much of an expert. Uh, I don't even now, right? So. Uh, I should know more than I did at the time of ACS. But uh, uh, it, it was an interesting project. We, we, we learned a lot of stuff. And, uh, what do you think is your strength? Well, I don't know. I have a lot of curiosity and enthusiasm about things. And if, uh, if uh, something seems a lot better, I would like to have it done that way. Right? And. Uh, so, I, I mean, I try to do well, so. Okay, you went, <coughs> so out of ACS then, uh, you come, you then went to NYU. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. And then you came back? Yeah, right, and. You uh, decided, I mean, did you think at all about staying in academia? Yeah, I thought about it, but, uh, I don't know. I sort of like the idea of building computers and this and that. And academia is not a good place to build computers, right? I mean, it's gotten so it's a lot better now that they have. Uh, I mean, I feel that uh, Conroy and uh, Mead and Conway, right? Conway, Conway and Breeze are the ones that usually think. Yeah, right. Since that time, right? VLSI. Uh, Why don't you put that together in a full sentence? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Uh, academia is not a, I like building computers and academia at the time was not a very good place to build computers. Although now it seems to have changed since uh, VLSI makes it a lot easier to, to, to build computers. And it may get even more so. Uh, 
So, uh, What's kept you in IBM over the years when everybody like Birnbaum and uh, Andy Heller and people have left? Uh, well, I always, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't get a, a job offer like they did it, like Joel, like Joel did. And, uh, uh, I, uh, I sort of uh, have always liked it and uh, felt like uh, IBM was a, could, I liked big machines and I always felt like IBM could afford them. So forth. Although uh, I should say high performance machines, I look at the 6000 as not a big machine, but it, uh, it's, it's sophisticated. I mean, it has very high performance. It, it does very well for its technology. Well, why don't we go back and talk about the 801 and how you got into that? <clears throat> well, uh, I would just. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, whether IBM might go into the phone business, and at the time I started considering how fast you could build a uh, controller for a switch, and uh, uh, the, the number was uh, uh, something like a million lines an hour that they wanted to set up. and. Uh, they, uh, we knew how many, uh, pro roughly, we felt that it would take roughly 20,000 instructions to uh, set up a call. It's probably more now. I mean, they, they do fancier things, but that should have done it for a, 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 a network, uh, uh, a gateway, a they, phone company. If you're going across international boundaries, like if you leaving England and going to France, it would be called a gateway exchange. For gateway exchanges, uh, uh, 20,000 instructions would have probably done. So we figured out how many, uh, what, how many MIPS we wanted the machine to do, and I, I looked at whether we, we could do it and what, what kind of machine organization you might want. And I felt we'd want a, both an instruction and data cache, right, so that uh, they could be running in parallel. And so that sort of started, we built uh, that machine and that sort of started uh, what we would want with, uh, with, with risk. And we, we worked on compilers. I felt that we would have to, uh, everything should be coded in a higher level language to make it good for debugging. And uh, we, uh, we worked on projects like uh, register allocation, things like that, and uh, uh, various things about the compiler, and uh, which we started on. And uh, uh, so the, uh, it was, um, uh, I, we, wa we wanted to build a high-speed scientific machine. We built the RT, and uh, it wasn't really a good uh, thing for scientific, so we wanted to build a, a high-speed scientific machine, and uh, we had a project called Ellis, which was to build a bipolar machine, a pretty fast machine up in uh, 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 Kingston uh, that Carl Carney was sort of funding for us, but uh, then uh, I gave a presentation. I wanted to give, I wanted to go up and talk about how you could build a machine that would be just as fast as vectors, that you didn't need vectors, and that you would be much better off to not have to have vectors because you'd get the compiler, you could get a performance you wanted, and if things were sparse and this and that, be much more uniform, you, you're better off without them. And they wouldn't let me talk at a SAC meeting up there. I mean, the people who control performance would not uh, even consider it. I mean, and it irritated me, and I sort of had to beg people at the next SAC meeting to be able to talk, and I was allowed to talk. And I then talked to Bertram, and he uh, allowed me, he was the one who said, well, he would back me. You know, he would figure out how to say we, we could get a certain amount of market uh, estimate and so on. 
build a machine out of FET that would be pretty fast, and uh, it would be. Uh, Well, uh, not noticeably. I don't classify uh, myself of having done much in signature verification. What about language translation? Language translation I'm uh, fairly interested in, actually. I mean, there's a good project that the speech recognition guys are doing, and I'm, I am sort of cooperating with that project. And I sort of had the, uh, a fundamental scheme of how to get data, namely try to uh, uh, Hansard, you know what Hansard is? Hansard is the uh, some guy named Hansard in a, years ago started writing down the proceedings of the British Parliament, and so in Canada and England and India and all those places, uh, the recordings of their uh, legislative bodies are called Hansards. And turns out in uh, Canada, uh, it's in both French and English, and so. Uh, they, the Canadians uh, do a very good job of, of putting it down and having a date-time group of every paragraph and so forth. So I wanted to sort of have a, get all that stuff and put all the sentences in one-to-one -one correspondence. And we had various schemes for doing that. And then uh, sort of uh, build a dictionary which depended on context, you know, uh, a specialized dictionary of for, say, parliamentary type talk, and uh, it would be, uh, uh, it would uh, depend on, on the context, and we could, we would get, uh, we, we, we could get that data from, from this. I'll give you an example, let me think of a good example. Uh, uh, in, uh, in English, the word standing what is it in French? Permanente. Now, how do you, why do you think that? Standing committee, standing order. See that under those circumstances of words, that's where it came. Uh, it would be uh, translated into permanente. So that that there would be uh, uh, how we would uh, have it uh, in context. Translate uh, a, a dictionary which depended on context. Neat. Were you ever into natural language processing? Was I what? Did you ever get into natural language processing? Oh, I uh, a little. Uh, no, uh, not for running a computer. I, I've I've never thought that that was any good. I mean, I've always thought it was. Uh, regular Fortran is better than English for. Uh, describing what you want done in uh, uh, computing something. Okay. <clears throat> um, somebody also mentioned that you had been looking into video cameras or so ideas of cameras. Into what? Ideas of cameras. Um, not really. Oh, cameras. Yeah, I've, I have had some thoughts. Like, uh, uh, I wanted to have uh, a camera that, uh, say I, I own a Canon, which I uh, did, and this Canon, uh, uh, you can set, it had a little button so you could set it at half or a quarter exposure, you could change the exposure quickly and press a button. But what I wanted, and it also had automatic film advance. The type of thing I would have liked to have had would, you press a button, it takes a picture, and it takes five pictures, uh, and changing the exposure for each different uh, picture. And so that uh, then when you developed it, you would uh, correlate the pictures, you know, scan them off, correlate them, and stack them together. And that would increase the dynamic range of the film. Right, I mean, because film is somewhat nonlinear. If 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 you get exposures that you uh, overexpose it, 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 you won't see much, and underexpose you won't. So this would be uh, 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 allow you to to have pictures, which uh, I don't know whether you could really print them in that and make it look good. But uh, you know, there is this scheme of uh, they call uh, homeomorphic. 
uh, you, you, you process digitally the pictures where you take uh, the Fourier transform and filter. And what you do is uh, you, uh, uh, you, filter, you assume that uh, the illumination is, uh, oh, and you also take the log so that you, uh, it makes it a sum. So when I, so I, uh, I assume that what I look at is the product of illumination times reflectivity. And I want to, uh, in the low frequency stuff, I consider illumination. And I take that away, and uh, then I, I see, uh, I see reflectivity, and that's basically what you want. It's, it's what the what the thing looks like, and they they do do that. But uh, if you had uh, if you'd expand the dynamic range of the film a great deal, it would be uh, it would be uh, you, you could do this processing a lot better. Uh, if, for instance, if uh, they have. Uh, if you take a picture of a hydrogen bomb exploding, they have uh, uh, lots of different uh, film, se several uh, 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 layers of film with different exposures. And uh, that gives it hard to make it. So you have the aperture very small uh, because you're not too worried about brightness if it's an H-bomb. And uh, you can stop down the shutter, and so it makes the depth of field more. And uh, then uh, you can have layers of film, so you get more than one ex uh, exposure possible. Uh, you know, so that was sort of uh, I was thinking of applying that to something that an individual could do. And no doubt, when they get uh, 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 diode. Uh, you, electronic photography, they will be able to make pictures much better than you can print and so forth, which we ought to start doing as soon as we can and save the pictures till the day we get technology to make the printing okay. You know, get a picture that's better, uh, uh, better than you can possibly display, which sounds sort of crazy, but anyway, uh, it can be saved for future generations. Mm. Well, I'm always, uh, uh, I sort of believe that computers ought to be able to think. I mean, I'm, I'm going along with the more or less radical AI people, and for that reason, uh, I, uh, uh, and I, I don't think much of books like Penrose. You know, I, I would more or less go along with people like Minsky rather than books like Penrose. I mean, they, they uh, I believe that an algorithm running is, is really, uh, a representation of, of thinking and uh, uh, so forth and uh, uh, so, so I mean I, I've always been interested in in the thought uh, early days on uh, you read about intelligence amplification uh, which is also I, I thought part of AI and uh, uh, things like uh, scratch pad and, and uh, uh, Mathematica, uh, I believe, are, are, that is coming to be true. For instance, I can easily understand how, what the thing is to factor. I mean, because when it's factored, I can multiply them together, polynomials together, and understand them. But uh, uh, the computer can factor like a shot, and it, it's really good at it, and uh, uh, I believe well, uh, uh, there will be a great deal of, of uh, the, you know, intelligence amplification, and computers, I believe, will think, and uh, so I, 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 that's a, a reason to uh, be interested. I mean, philosophical enough reason to, to. Can you go back and take that into one sentence? Hmm. hmm. <laughs> That's an awful lot of sentences yeah. to be one but sentence. But now that you've gone through the idea. That reminds me of uh, 
years ago when uh, you became a senior engineer in IBM, you had to uh, give a, uh, a speech. And Sully Campbell was a good speaker, plus the fact that he was quite verbose. And the person who introduced him said, Sully, you can just have two sentences. So he talked for about 10 minutes, and at the end of that time he said, that's one. And went on for another 10 minutes and said, that's two. And that was it. And, uh, <laughs> but I don't know what to, how to do that right now. Uh, let's see what I can do. Uh, I've, I've always been interested in computers because I, I feel that uh, ultimately Turing's thesis will uh, be the case, that computers will think and so forth and be of great advantage to society having computers think. And uh, even in the, uh, before they are actually able to think, I think it will serve as intelligence amplifiers. They certainly already do if you want to multiply two numbers together. They do it marvelously. And uh, also things like Scratchpad and uh, uh, Mathematica uh, serve to increase our facilities at doing algebra and elementary uh, calculus and, and so forth. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, it, uh, things like uh, designing uh, servo systems and so forth can be carried out by more systematic procedures uh, like that Coleman and people like that introduced 20 years ago and now computers are getting really so that those procedures would be cheap ways of, of designing uh, servo systems. Yes and no is not necessarily so simplistic. I uh, once heard a lecture by some Japanese guy of which at the end of the lecture, even though I thought I knew something about the subject, I hadn't understood a single word he'd said. And so at that time, I thought I should get something out of the lecture, and I asked him a question. And he gave me a great giant, which I thought could be answered uh, yes or no. He gave a fairly long answer, in which point I said, does that mean yes or no, and got another great long answer, <laughs> in which case I, I sort of gave up. But Yes and no are not necessarily simplistic. 